In this video, we're going to cover an introduction to acids and bases. So acids have a sour taste. They can dissolve metal. They uh, can neutralize bases. They change blue litmus paper to red. Um, and what uh, designates an acid is that when we look at a chemical formula that's represented this way, an acid usually has an H on the front. It doesn't always, but I'd say 95% of the time, if, the, if uh, a compound that is an acid will have an H listed at the front of that compound. So notice that in this compound there, H is listed twice. So there are, what that's saying is there are two different kinds of hydrogen atoms in this molecule. The one that comes first, the H that's at the beginning of the formula, always designates the acidic H. And any H's that are any other H's that are in the formula that don't that don't uh, aren't grouped here at the beginning, these H's are not acidic. So this is the structure of this molecule: H, C2. Here's the two C's. These three H's, and then O2. So. So the H that comes first is the acidic H, and the acidic H is this one. And we can see that this H is uh, bonded to an oxygen. And then there's three other H's, these three right here, and these three H's are bonded to a carbon. So being bonded to an oxygen makes this H an acid. And being bonded to a carbon means that these H's are not acids. So the atom which the H is bonded to determines whether or not that H is going to be an acid. Just because there are H's in a formula doesn't mean they're all acidic. Only this H that's bonded to oxygen is acidic. Binary acids have acid hydrogens attached to a non-metal atom. So binary means two. So um, binary acids have two elements and one of the elements is always an H. So really, it's just an H stuck to something else. Um, there are halogen acids, uh, those that are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine uh, bonded to an H. This is hydrochloric acid, HCl. Remember back in chapter four, we um, covered nomenclature of acids. So when we're talking about a binary acid, we always have to name the H. So this would be named hydro, and then we would name the second element. This is a chlorine atom. And when we're talking about an acid, it becomes chloric. And then we put acid at the end, hydrochloric acid. There's um, also what we call oxy acids. And these acids have acidic hydrogens that are attached to oxygen atoms um, and generally have more than uh, just two elements. So in this case, sulfur and oxygen and hydrogen. So these um, oxy acids have oxygen and um, at least one other element, sulfur or nitrogen in this case. So we can see here there are two H's at the beginning of this one, H2SO4. That means that this has two acidic hydrogens because both of those H's are grouped up front. So here are the two acidic H's on sulfuric acid. Um, the sulfur atom is in the middle and it's bonded to these four oxygens and then the two hydrogen atoms are stuck on two of these oxygens. So again we see that when hydrogen is bonded to oxygen that makes that hydrogen an acidic atom. Um, here's nitric acid uh, where H again is bonded to oxygen and we have this uh, what comes from the polyatomic ion nitrate. And finally, um, a carboxylic acid is a type of oxy acid that specifically has this group um, that has a carbon. So we saw in this previous slide, we have these oxy acids with nitrogen and sulfur. And when I have an oxy acid like this with a carbon, we call these carboxylic acids. And so um, 
these are usually uh, going to be components of much larger molecules. And so when we look at organic molecules that are made of many different carbon atoms, um, they are typically much larger than the four, five, six, seven, eight kind of atom molecules that we've looked at so far. And so they be can become pretty uh, complicated to look at because there's so many atoms. So when we are looking at an organic molecule with lots of atoms, we want to look for parts of it. And this part is called a carboxylic acid. And this helps us to identify if any part of that molecule is an acid. And with an organic molecule that's fairly large, it's going to have lots of hydrogens, but most of those hydrogens are not acidic. So look here um, is the formula for citric acid. It's a fairly large organic molecule. It has hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. And hydrogen, C, is broken up twice here. So these first hydrogens are the acidic hydrogens. And the hydrogens here are not acidic. It implies since they don't come from first, since they're here grouped later, that implies that they're not acidic. So when we're looking at this structure, we want to be able to identify which H's are acidic in the structure and which H's are not. And so the way that we do that is by looking for groups like this, like a carboxylic acid group, where an H is bonded to an O. So um, acids taste sour and bases taste bitter. And bases also feel slippery. So soap feels really slippery. And soap is an example of a base. Um, they can turn red litmus paper blue, and they can neutralize acids. Here are some common household bases. Um, sodium hydroxide, a common base that um, is used in soap manufacturing. This is also the main component of Drano. Uh, potassium hydroxide is also an industrial chemical. It's used for these industrial processes. You can also make soap with potassium hydroxide. Uh, it's used in batteries. Um, sodium bicarbonate is um, baking soda. Sodium carbonate is, is called washing soda. Um, and uh, it's used in some industrial processes. Ammonia is a, a detergent, and you use this when you're cleaning your house sometimes. So these are all different examples of bases. You can see that um, these two bases have OH in them. And again, back in chapter four, when we introduced acids and bases, we saw that acids always have an H in the front, and bases typically have this OH in them. Well, we're going to learn now in this chapter, we're going to expand our definition of base and say that, yes, these are, these are definitely bases that have OH in them, this hydroxide ion. But there are other bases that don't have a hydroxide bicarbonate, carbonate, ammonia, these are all bases also, and they don't have OH. They don't possess a hydroxide ion. So we're going to have to expand our definition of base in this chapter. So what does an acid do? We saw an acid is HCl, where the H comes first. It looks like this. It's an H bonded to a Cl, in this case, hydrochloric acid. What happens when hydrochloric acid goes into water? Well, here's the HCl, and here's the H2O. A, um, a chemical reaction occurs. And an acid, we can think of an acid as being an, like an ionic compound. Now this is very misleading, because for a long time when I was a chemistry student and I was just starting out, I thought acids were ionic compounds, because you see this kind of reaction written down often. We say, oh, well, if this is made out of an H plus and a Cl minus, then it must be ionic, just like if it was NaCl, Na plus and Cl minus. If, if it's H plus and Cl minus, then it must also be ionic. But that's not true because H is a nonmetal and Cl is a nonmetal. So if these are both nonmetals, then this is not an ionic bond in between these atoms. Look, they're stuck together like this. This is a covalent bond. This is not an ionic compound. So this is uh, misleading. HCl is covalent. They're both nonmetals. It's not ionic. But when HCl goes into water, a chemical reaction occurs. This is what's really happening. HCl reacts with H2O, and the H2O, this O, grabs the H and takes it away from Cl. And then it becomes Cl minus. And then since the 
H2O gains an extra H, it becomes H3O. And when it gains that H, it also gets a positive charge. So it, gets, it becomes H3O plus, and the Cl is left behind as Cl minus. So you can see this H plus and H2O makes H3O plus. Right, and that's just this down here, H3O plus, is what happens when I mix an acid with water. The H from the acid goes to the water, and H2O turns into H3O plus. So um, this, don't be confused when you see this representation. HCl is not ionic. HCl is covalent, because these are both nonmetals. But when it goes into water, it doesn't fall apart like an ion would. It doesn't become dissociated in a physical, uh, a physical reaction. It, it undergoes a chemical reaction where this chemical reaction is occurring and the oxygen is actually breaking the bond between the H and the Cl by donating electrons to the H. So this is a chemical reaction. So just to, just to emphasize what I'm, what I'm saying here, this is an ionic compound, NaCl. This is a metal and this is a nonmetal. When an ionic compound goes into water, the plus and the minus split up. So remember, right here, this is right now Na plus and Cl minus. They're just stuck together, and we represent it like this. The plus and the minus cancel out, so we don't write any charges. So right now, this is Na plus Cl minus. And when it goes into water, the water is able to separate the plus and the minus from each other. But the plus and the minus existed back here also. They were just stuck together and the water helps break them apart. Here we have a plus and a minus, H3O plus and Cl minus, but this compound does not contain any pluses and minuses. Right? The difference is we have H, Cl, where they're sharing electrons, and we have Na plus Cl minus where they're not sharing electrons and they are, they've already transferred the electrons. They're already plus and minus before this even goes into water. So this is, this is called ionization. And this process is called dissociation. So dissociation is a physical process whereby an ionic bond uh, becomes hydrated and the ions are separated. Ionization is a chemical process where an acid and a base react and an H is transferred to the H2O. So H, acids have this H plus ion. A, well, again, it's not an ionic. Acids contain a very weak bond between the H and whatever atom is holding it. That weak bond makes it act as if H is positive. It acts as if it has an H plus on it, even though it's not really ionic. So um, that H plus ion, the reason that this we can't just put this in water and have it to produce plus and minus ions is first because again it's not ionic but second because H plus is very very um, reactive and so Na plus it's fine for Na plus to be in water it's surrounded by water molecules but H plus is so reactive it can't be surrounded by water molecules because those water molecules have extra electrons and oxygen really likes being bonded to H it's already bonded to 2 H2O so why not be bonded to another one? It'd be H3O. So oxygen just donates electrons to H to make H3O+. So H does not hang out in water by itself. H plus cannot be in water all by itself. If H plus is in water, it always exists like this, H3O+. But here's what we're, this is, the, this is what we're seeing, right? Um, H2O has eight electrons, two, four, six, eight. The oxygen has a full octet. And so it has these two lone pairs of electrons on the um, oxygen, on water. And one of those lone pairs of electrons can be used to make a bond with this H+. And so then what we get is this, where now, instead of being a lone pair, now it's a bonding pair, just like these two are bonding pairs. Now there's only one lone pair left. But you can see that this is really just water 
include that, water, and H plus. So when eight when we have H3O plus, when H3O plus is created in water, it is very similar to H to H plus because H3O plus is just water with an extra H plus. So sometimes we will see this written in uh, in our book and sometimes in this PowerPoint, um, sometimes online when you look at different uh, different um, literature, different sources, different references. H3O plus and H plus are treated as if they're the same thing. Sometimes you'll see it written H plus is in the aqueous solution. That's not ever technically true. H plus is never technically in an aqueous solution. It always exists as H3O plus bonded with water. And if it's going to be traded to something else, that other thing reacts with H3O plus. It doesn't react with H plus. But because it's chemists are lazy, we sometimes will write H plus when we really, really mean H3O plus. And so we expect you guys, we expect students to understand that H3O plus and H plus really kind of mean the same thing, even though they're not really the same. Right? H plus is just one proton all by itself, and H3O plus is water with an extra proton. So again, this doesn't really ex exist in water ever. It always looks like this. But sometimes we'll write it like this because we're lazy. Okay, and similarly, um, when bases go into water, uh, if we can, we can imagine an acid goes into water and it makes an H plus and a Cl minus. When a base goes into water, it makes Na plus and OH. This should be minus minus. So um, again, we just went over this in detail on that other slide, so I'm not going to go over it again. But this process here is called dissociation. NaOH is just like NaCl because I have a metal oh, metal and then these pieces up here, this is these are both nonmetals, oxygen and hydrogen nonmetal. So this is ionic. So if this is ionic, this piece is already plus even before it goes into water, and this piece is already minus even before it goes into water. So when they go into water, the water just breaks them apart. The OH minus was already part of this compound to begin with. This process is physical. It's called dissociation. So I put the solid sodium hydroxide in water, it breaks apart, and there's Na plus and OH minus now. So a solution that has lots of H plus or H3O plus So a solution that has lots of H3O plus, right? These w water molecules with an extra H. A, wa a solution that has lots of extra H3O plus we call an acidic solution. And similarly, a solution that has lots of OH minus dissolved hydroxide ions, we call that a basic solution. So there are different um, definitions of acids and bases. This is the earliest historical definition, and it's the most simple. It's called the Arrhenius, the Arrhenius definition of an acid and base. So in the Arrhenius acid and base, acid equals H plus, base equals OH minus. It's as simple as it gets, this, this definition. But as we're going to see, and as I kind of introduced this video saying, we have to expand our definition of base because a base is not just OH minus. There's more to it than that. 
but the historically the first definition the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases was this H plus OH minus so what happens when H plus and OH minus get together they make H2O right I have OH1 when it gets an extra H it becomes H2O and the plus and the minus combine to become neutral so H plus and OH minus become H2O so this is what we mean when we say um, that acids and bases can neutralize each other. This is an acid, this is a base, and when they get together, they become water, and water is neutral. So they, they neutralize each other. So in this reaction, an acid plus a base come together, and now when I say H plus and OH minus, remember these aren't by themselves. In fact, H plus doesn't ever really exist in water ever. It's actually H3O plus. But the, even so, the OH minus doesn't come by itself. We saw it in the last slide as being NaOH. So even though this is the most simple form of an acid-base reaction, H plus plus OH minus makes H2O, this is what we call the net ionic equation. Remember um, from chapter four when we were looking at uh, different types of reactions and when we're talking about ions we can ignore the spectators right so the other pieces of the acid the other piece of the acid the Cl minus in this case or the other piece of the base the Na plus in this case those are spectators so when I represent the equation like this I'm ignoring the spectators I'm just writing the actual chemistry that happened the net ionic equation but this is the complete equation right here so the H plus doesn't come by itself it comes attached to Cl and we call that HCl and the OH minus doesn't come by itself it comes attached to Na and we call that NaOH so when I put these two together acid plus base what happens remember back from that same chapter I keep referencing a lot these guys switch places the Na comes over here so on the other side I get NaCl and the H comes over here so on the other side I get HOH which is H2O right so the Na comes over here NaCl and the H switches places comes over here H2O so they just do the old switcheroo here and um, what we call this component this happens to be salt right sodium chloride is salt it's what we put on our food but even if this didn't happen to be sodium chloride, like let's change these. Let's make this bromide and let's make this um, lithium. All right? Then I wouldn't get sodium chloride over here. I'd get lithium bromide. And lithium bromide is not what we put on our food. But lithium bromide is salt. Salt equals ionic compound. Any ionic compound, chemists call all ionic compounds salts. NaCl happens to be the salt that we call salt, but every ionic compound is a salt to a chemist. So anytime I add any acid and any base together, I always generate water and I always generate a salt. It's only sometimes this one, but it will always be some ionic compound because the other half of the acid that's not H+, the other half of the acid is always going to be some anion. Br-, minus, Cl-, minus, um, uh, HSO4-, minus, NO3-, minus. it will always be some anion. And the other half of OH-, minus, will always be some cation, Li+, plus, Na+, plus, Ca2+, plus. it will always be positive. So half of the acid is negative, half of the base is positive, and that positive and negative are always going to come together in the products to make a salt, to make a positive negative ionic compound. So again, that was the Arrhenius definition of acid base. So the next 
uh, definition, the one, the more evolved definition of an acid and base is called the Bronsted-Lowry definition. So acids pretty much stay the same. Arrhenius said acid is H+, Bronsted and Lowry said acid is H+, but they changed base. Arrhenius said base is OH-, Bronsted-Lowry said the base is an H plus acceptor. So the acid is anything that has an H plus to give away, and the base is anything that accepts that H plus. So OH minus is one example. OH minus can accept H plus because it has extra electrons, right? This negative charge represents electrons. Electrons are used to make bonds. So these extra electrons can reach out and grab this plus and make a bond. And so we would make a bond and make H2O. So um, OH minus is one H plus acceptor. OH minus can accept this H plus, but other things can accept an H plus two. Like sometimes things that aren't even necessarily negative, like NH3, ammonia. We saw that ammonia is a base. We saw that in a previous slide here. So how ammonia can do what oxygen is doing here. So how does oxygen reach out and grab H, accept that H? Because remember, oxygen has electrons. When it's OH minus, it has three lone pairs of electrons. So I should fix this arrow, because this arrow is actually coming from the electrons. It's the electrons, the lone pair of electrons, that reaches out and accepts H+. So N, oh, if I could get my pen to make a dot here. Nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons. When we're talking about ammonia, if we draw the Lewis structure for ammonia, we can see that nitrogen has one lone pair of electrons. So nitrogen can reach out with those electrons and grab H+. And then it would become N H four plus. So the base is an H plus acceptor. Anything that has a lone pair of electrons that can accept an H plus is a base. So really, where bases are anything with unpaired electrons, with an unshared pair of electrons. So that makes our definition of base way, way, way more broad than OH minus, what we had been looking at before. OH minus does have a pair of electrons, but lots of other things have a pair of electrons too. So when we're writing a generic uh, chemical equation for acids and bases, we can just say HA, because an acid is always something that has an H, and then it has something else. So the other part of the acid, whatever it is, and remember, sometimes it's big. When we looked at citric acid, it was like H3C8H5O4. There were lots and lots of atoms, right? So A, we might be talking about 20 or 30 atoms that are all represented in A. And the H is the only one acidic proton on that whole molecule. Well, it's the only part that we care about when we're talking about an acid. The acid is the H that, that's able to come off and, and react as H+. So any generic acid is HA, whatever A happens to be. And then therefore, any generic base is B with a lone pair. This is the only thing that a base needs to be a base, something with a lone pair of electrons. So this right here is a generic reaction for every acid-base reaction there is. I have an acid that has an H to give away, and I have a base that accepts that H. And so over here, I can see that the acid gave away the H, now it has a lone pair and a negative charge, and the base gained that H with its lone pair. It used its lone pair to take H, and now it has the H and it has a positive charge. So again, anything with an H plus, Bronsted-Lowry, that's the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid. It has um, an H plus to give away. And generally when we look at a chemical formula, that H comes first. And generally when we look at a chemical structure, that H is attached to an electronegative atom, most often an oxygen. 
So when HCl dissolves in water, the HCl is the acid because HCl transfers H plus to water. So HCl plus water, what happens on this side? Well, we can say this is HA plus B in equilibrium with A minus plus B H plus. So this is just the generic reaction that represents all acid-base reactions and here's how it's represented with this specific reaction. My specific, rea uh, specific acid is HCl, my specific base is H2O, the acid gives this H away to the base, the base accepts it, so the base becomes H3O because it accepts an H, and the HCl becomes Cl because it lost an H. And similarly, like we just showed, um, NH3 is a base because it can accept an H+. And so what's interesting about putting bases in water, if a base can accept an H+, then that means that a base can accept an H+, from a water molecule. So we have seen water being the H plus acceptor. It takes the H away from something else, right? But water can also give its H away. So H2O can become H3O if H2O is becoming a base and it takes the H away. Or H2O can become H1O if it's acting as an acid and it gives one of its H's up. So in this reaction, look what's happening here. H2O becomes H1O, it gave one of its H's away, and NH3 becomes NH4, it took the H. So we saw NH3 as a base, how does it do this? It has a lone pair of electrons. So it uses its lone pair of electrons to reach out and grab one of these H's. So then it becomes NH4+, and what it leaves behind after it takes an H away from water it leaves behind OH minus. So Arrhenius was wrong to say that all bases are OH minus. But Arrhenius was kind of right too because look even though NH3 does not contain OH minus in it, when I put NH3 in water it makes OH minus. So Arrhenius knew that NH3 was a base even if he didn't know what its chemical structure was. Even if he didn't know that it didn't have hydroxide in it, he knew that when he put it in water, hydroxide was there. Whether it came from this or whether it came from the water, it was there in the solution afterwards. So bases, because they can accept an H, and because water can donate that H, water can act as an acid or a base, We'll see that in a minute. That means that bases in water make OH minus. So Arrhenius was kind of right and wrong. When we're looking at a list of compounds, NaOH, CaOH2, NH3, um, H. LIHSO4. When we look at all of these different compounds, these are the ones that look like bases because they have OH minus. But this is also a base because if I put this in water, it makes OH minus. And this is also a base because if I put this in water, it dissociates, and this part, the conjugate base, will react with water and make OH minus. So Arrhenius would only have called these two bases because these are the only two that have OH in them. But it turns out that all of these are bases, but the reason that they're all bases is because they all produce OH. So we're going to see this OH minus come back in the definition of base when, we're try when we calculate the acidity of a solution or the basicity of a solution. We can calculate the amount of H plus or the amount of OH minus 
even if the base that we put into water doesn't have OH- in it because like we see in this reaction it can make OH- so again water is um, and could be an acid or a base we call these amphoteric substances so water has uh, what you need to be an acid is have H acid equals have H right you have to have an H and it has to can't just be any H it has to be an H that's acidic that's able to with a weak bond that's able to be donated and a base means have lone pair well some species have both of these water if you haven't noticed it's really hard to draw dots with this system so water has H's H's that are stuck to oxygen, so that makes them acidic H's. And water also has lone pairs. So water could be an acid, because it could donate this H. And water can be a base, because it can accept an H, because it has lone pairs. So water is amphoteric. It has both of these. It has, can meet both of these criteria. So we can see here, water acts as a base. It takes the H, it becomes H3O+. Here we see water acts as an acid it loses an H and it becomes OH minus. So water can go H2O to H3O plus or H2O to OH minus. Right, water kind of exists in the middle of these two species. Depending on whether I add an acid or a base to water, it could do either of these. So when acids and bases react, um, on the left side of the reaction, on the reactant side, I have an acid and a base, obviously, because I'm talking about an acid-base reaction. So here we say NH3 is the base because it has a lone pair, and it's going to react with water and take one of its uh, protons, one of the H plus atoms, and um, w so then H, uh, the acid donates the H and the base accepts the H. So we have an acid base on this side of the reaction. But on this side of the reaction, after the reaction's done, I also have an acid and a base. So again, H2O is an acid because it can donate an H. If, a if H2O donates an H, it becomes OH minus. But we, we've seen OH minus before, and we know that OH minus is actually a base, right? OH minus is a base. So when water loses its H+, plus, here's water, H2O. If I take an H away, now it's HO-. minus. So this is acid and base, right? And over here, this is OH minus this is base and if I go this way and add H plus to it then it becomes O it's got these three H's on it H3O plus and this is an acid so H2O is an acid or base. If it acts as an acid and an H goes away, then it becomes more basic. It loses its acidity. It acts as an acid, we remove an H. H plus is an acid, so it acts as an acid, it loses its acidity, it becomes a base. So now it's a base. So a base can accept that H plus, and if it accepts that H plus, it becomes more acidic. So now it's an acid and a base. So now, it can accept even more H plus and become even more acidic. So now it's just an acid. 
because it lost its base property because it acted like an it acted like a base twice. Here it acted like a base, it gained an H. Here it acted like a base, it gained an H again. It can't act as a base anymore. So water exists on this continuum depending on whether it's going to act as an acid and go this way or whether water is going to act as a base and go this way. So what we see then down here in this reaction is that water, when it, after it acts as an acid, it becomes a base. And we can see that here with the NH3 too. NH3 was a base, but after NH3 takes H away from water, it becomes an acid. So we have an acid and a base on both sides. Acid base on the reactant side, acid base on the product side. The acid base on the product side, they're called conjugate acid and conjugate base. And see, the acid becomes a base. The acid becomes the conjugate base. And the base from the reactant side becomes the conjugate acid. So I know this seems kind of confusing, but an acid, after it reacts, it turns into a base. And a base, after it reacts, it turns into an acid. And that kind of makes sense, because look at these arrows that go back and forth here. If acid and base can react to go this way, then these two things can react again to go this way. It's just the reverse reaction, right? So acid and base makes us go forward, and we, we switch roles, but then acid and base can react again and make us go this way until we reach equilibrium, right? It de depends on the rate of the forward reaction versus the rate of the reverse reaction. So where equilibrium lies depends on whether this is a stronger acid or this is a stronger acid. So we can determine, well, does the reaction go forward and make this acid and base? Or are the is this acid and base going to react and go backwards to make these two? Well, to answer that question, we have to know how strong the acids and how strong the bases are. But in general, we can designate, we can represent this equilibrium of any acid and base reaction like this. An acid plus a base are going to react to make a conjugate acid and a conjugate base. So here's another representation of that. Here's water as a base. Here's HF as an acid. The only thing that happens in an acid-base reaction is one H is moving. Look, that's the only thing. This H right here moved. Now it's over here. And we go back. Now it's over here. We go this way. Now it's over here. The H is doesn't the react. There's not much that happens in the reaction. The H just goes right there. So wherever this H is, that makes that thing the acid. So this H right here is the hot potato. It's the acid. So after the reaction happens, O reaches out and it grabs that H with those electrons. And now O has that acidic hot potato. Now this is the acid. Well, now F reaches back and it grabs the hot potato, right? And then the reaction moves back this way. And now F has the hot potato. Now F is the acid. Whoever has that proton is the acid. That is the acidic proton and it gets traded back and forth as this reaction moves back and forth. Because water is both an acid and a base, that means that it can react with itself, and it does react with itself. So believe it or not, H2O, pure H2O, is not only H2O. It does not contain only H2O inside of it. Pure H2O, two H2O molecules can react with each other and make one H3O plus and one OH minus. Right? This one gives an H to this one, or this one gives an H to this one. Either way, we end up like this. They've traded H's. So within pure water, pure water has a little tiny bit of this and a little tiny bit of this. All pure water does. So in pure H2O that doesn't have any ions in it, it has H2O mostly, like 99.99999% H2O, but it has a little tiny bit of H3O plus and a little tiny bit of OH minus. Here it says two out of every one billion water molecules, one of them is H3O plus and one of them is OH minus. The other 
999,999,999,998 are H2O. So at 25 degrees, the concentration of H3O plus is equal to the concentration of OH minus because that makes sense. However much of this I have in pure water is equal to the amount of this that I have because they come from two water molecules reacting. Every time I get an H3O plus, I also get an OH minus. So since, that all, since that's always true with two waters running into each other, their concentration is going to be equal. And at 25 degrees C, we say the concentration of H3O plus and OH minus is 10 to the negative 7 molar. So this reaction here, even though this arrow looks kind of funky, this reaction is in equilibrium, right? We've got an equilibrium here. So because this is an equilibrium, we can identify, represent an equilibrium expression. So remember, equilibrium expression equals products over reactants. Let's add some phases here, right? This is aqueous. This is aqueous dissolved in water, liquid water, liquid water. OK, so we write products over reactants. So we've got H3O plus times OH minus. And we put that over the reactants unless the reactants, or any of them, are liquids or solids. And both of the reactants here are pure liquids. So both of these reactants would get left out of this equilibrium expression. And so the equilibrium expression for the auto-ionization of water just has H3O plus times OH minus. And so this is a special K expression that we call KW. And that stands for the auto-ionization of water. So that means that if I know that pure water at 25 degrees C, this is 10 to the minus 7 molar. And this is 10 to the minus 7 molar. Then Kw equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14. So what does that tell us? That tells us that this is an equilibrium, and our equilibrium constant is incredibly small. Right? In chapter 13, we dealt with some small equilibrium constants, 10 to the minus 4, minus 5, minus 6. 10 to the minus 14 is a really, really, really small equilibrium constant. What does it mean when I have a really small equilibrium constant? It means that the products are very, very small, and the reactants are very, very large. It means there's far more reactant than there is concentration. And when I mean far more, I'm talking about uh, a million trillion times more, right? 1 times 10 to the negative 14 is such a huge amount that that means that at equilibrium, I have 99.9999999999999% water and 0.000000000000001% of these. So this is an equilibrium. It's an equilibrium where I have only a negligible, tiny, tiny, tiny amount of this stuff at equilibrium. So this Kw, we call this the dissociation constant of water, um, is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees C. So remember, just like any equilibrium constant, if I change the temperature, then I change the, the value of the equilibrium constant. So this is only true, it's only 1 times 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees C. At different temperatures, this number is different.